welcome back to the Garage Gym PT Podcast. As always, you got Lou and Dave. Uh, this is episode number four. Absolutely. And we're going to take this time to actually add another feature, which is going to be the <laughs> beer of the podcast, <laughs> as requested by some viewers. Um, but yeah, so today's beer is the Juicy Juice IPA via High Wire Brewing. This one out of the Cincinnati location. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's take a drink and get started. <laughs> I have my wonderful as well. So kind of building off what Dave and I had been talking about over the last two weeks. Um, we covered volume. We talked about frequency. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about intensity. Um, so intensity basically is just the difficulty of the work you're doing. Um, this could be the weight, this could be the resistance used in whatever exercise you're doing. So maybe band, chain, whatever it is. Um, for running, you could look at intensity as the speed. Um, basically, you could also tie this in kind of with volume. Like we were talking about last time, you can go and co kind of combine volume and the load, um, which is basically a combination of volume and intensity, uh, which you can calculate that by looking at the sets the repetitions, and then the weight or whatever resistance you're using. And that can help give you a full calculation on that. Um, one of the things about intensity that I think uh, is important to monitor is, I guess, one of the things we don't really always think about is, yeah, heavy weight, strain on the musculature, uh, but then also just the neural demands that come along with that. Um, we'll we'll kind of dive into that a little bit more uh, and what we mean by that. Um, but Dave, I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Um, to give a little bit more preface to that functional definition, uh, intensity is usually expressed as a percentage of your one rep max. So the weight's kind of irrelevant. So there's always going to be relativity to your max, whatever that might be. So he spoke towards um, running, endurance athletics. This is typically your max heart rate um, per, per prescribed zone. All right, so you would have like zones, I think it just goes one through four to five, um, depending on who you read. Yeah, it like depends a, on who you're going to use. Yeah, so it's an expressed max of your heart rate. Uh, we don't really need to get like a calculator, but usually 220 minus age is accurate, accurate enough to get your uh, max heart rate and be within ballpark. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the one rep max is an absolute test of strength. And then from there, you would build off of it. So a lot of times you'll see this expressed as higher volumes and lower percentages and lesser volumes and higher percentages. And you can even use a, uh, a Prilipin chart to see exactly how these are supposed to be expressed as you go into like a peaking phase. So this chart accurately shows desired sets reps within a, certain percentage range to achieve a desired goal, which is seen in a lot of traditional squat cycles. Yeah. Um, another thing that people use to account for stress would be an RPE scale, uh, going zero to 10 or one to 10, once again, depending on what you're using, mm -hmm. but this would account for a zero to 100% of perceived effort. Right. So mm -hmm. like we have dove into a number of times, your your cup may only be half full that day based upon life stresses, et cetera. So the younger you are, typically the fuller your cup and the lesser your your life stresses are, whereas the older you get, family, kids, job, even just training age, your cup may not be as full day to day. Um, which this may be a good tool to use to get the max out of the quote unquote cup you have that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I think one of the things managing intensity can sometimes be difficult. Um, especially like when you have like, let's say young athlete walks into the clinic. Um, I mean, you, you're, there's so many different variables that can factor into this about how you can monitor. You could look at training age, right? Kind of like we've talked about in the past. Um, 
but when you're recovering from injury and trying to manage intensity, I think that's sometimes where um, physical therapy as a whole kind of misses the mark sometimes. I don't know how you feel about that, Dave, but I just feel like I've had some some students who really almost underload or under like under intensify the exercises, if that's the right way of saying that, but like they don't put yeah. it to the level of like necessary for change. Yeah. Um, very, very key point there. As a, as a profession, we are notorious underloaders. And I mm-hmm. think that we are, we overestimate the change that we can make with our hands and underestimate the change that we can make with exercise, especially when you're talking about the nervous system. Mm-hmm. So the, the idea of PT in a whole, especially when you're considering like a training program uh, or removal from athletics mm-hmm. is essentially to decrease the intensity while keeping the adaptation and fixing the weak point. Um, and, and obviously all this kind of does tie back into total volume, frequency, can you make the adaption, et cetera. But if you mm-hmm. have somebody in your clinic and you're, you're completely taking the, the rug out from underneath the intensity, when they have a return to sport, they're going to continue to have issues. Bingo. And, it, and obviously this does depend on the sport. Um, mm-hmm. Like you're saying that that football setup is still something that's super ideal as far as maintaining volume, dropping intensity, and then basically having a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday to expend yourself and then go into a recovery phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Whereas the more frequent stuff, uh, soccer, baseball, basketball, I, I think it's all about kind of finding that bottom line. What can we hit and not have a uh, TNS drawback? However, Great. like when you're talking about pieces like Weightlifting, powerlifting, you have to keep your intensity somewhat high and pain free so you don't lose the central nervous system adaptation of going under heavy loads. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think that, that would be like one thing I wish we could add into physical therapy programs as a whole, like as the profession, would be to incorporate like the, the things we're talking about. Because when you go into athletics, And I almost feel like some people are almost like more timid to put people under load. But if you think about it, if you're walking down a step, how much load do you think you're putting through your leg all at once? Right. Exactly. But but we won't, we won't put 25, 50 pounds in someone's hand and let them do squats. Like, it's just, I don't know. I I could go on my soapbox here, but like, I just think we miss the mark so badly sometimes. And then the kids keep coming back in the door and back in the door. And it just drives me up a wall. And it's like when they finally do make it to a therapist that actually understands this concept of like strength and conditioning and applying these, these, these rules and applications, um, it's, it, it's like a switch goes off and they're like, holy crap. Like the yeah, pain it, is like significantly better. Feels like training. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. So when you look at the demand, it, even to put this to like a very simple level, uh, seeing mm-hmm. a knee replacement and putting them on a leg press and then say a surgeon getting mad at you for putting somebody on a leg press, despite the fact that the patient weighs 250 to 300 pounds and you're having them do a single leg leg press with 50 pounds <laughs> inciting therapy is like the reason that this person isn't succeeding or has knee pain. It's kind of asinine. Yeah. Uh, but to, to, to take this to a higher level example, um, like the, the knee joint in general, I'm a stickler for being able to perform split squats, especially doing it correctly mm-hmm. because your running, jumping, cutting is very highly dictated on your ability to accept load through that extremity. Mm-hmm. And in particular, the deceleration portion. And I sound like a broken record, but your ability to decelerate your body weight is essentially what dictates if you're going to get injured or not. So when you look at some of the research that kind of uh, is is about running, so the the force vectors that go through the knee go up in amplitude anywhere from like three to seven times your body weight, mm-hmm. depending on who you're reading. So in short, like 
is just the body weight squat intense enough to make a change? The answer is no, especially not for that person who's looking to return as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So if we could make any types of changes with an athlete, um, loading wise, like, so for example, I have a post-op ACL right now who, um, he's about middle of his rehab, but at like 10, 12 weeks, we started kind of gradually basically adding load to him. And he's been noticing like huge gains, not just in like strength, but then also like stability and balance. And it's like, oh, huh. We start adding strength training to this and you get stronger. Yeah, nail on the head, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. You, it's like, huh? It's like that. Yes, makes sense. Um, but then you look at it all and you think about how back, if you were to go back, like maybe, I want to say maybe five, ten years ago, people would have looked at you like you had four heads asking an ACL to do squats with load at like an early, early phase of the rehab set, like. Big yeah, time. Depending depending on the phase, yeah. Yeah. Um just oh man. I guess like we can kind of even just use like the, the ACL mm-hmm. as uh as the example. Um shoulders get a little bit more complicated. Um yeah, I agree. Uh I, I would I would just argue because it's a ball and socket joint relative to a hinge. So the hinge you can account for uh Pain's easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I've noticed too is getting getting somebody to about 80 to 90% of function is very easy. Mm-hmm. And then the ramp up back into uh, sport or hobby is always kind of the hardest part. Meaning that like, there is a there's a perceived idea that they had of where they used to be and they're not taking that past person and deleting it and reestablishing the intensity numbers yeah right so your your 300 pound back squat that you did before you tore your ACL is no longer your 300 pound back squat and it's borrowed mm-hmm. so therefore at some point you have to establish a new one rep max. And then that is now your 100% intensity and drop the comparison to build it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one piece we did miss the beginning is it's only a hundred percent if your form sticks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the second you deviate when you're going for a max effort, you call that lift and you get done with it. And then that should be your, quote unquote training max mm-hmm. because you want to hammer in the neurological adaptation correctly. Yeah. Otherwise you just ingrain those those bad movement patterns and then you're just asking for things down the line if you continue to try to progress the load with that type of pattern. Uh, right. So your your ACL being an example, if you squat with knee valgus uh, which could be for a number of reasons. Maybe that's yeah. like a whole episode within itself. But <laughs> yeah. are you risking a meniscus tear? Uh, pr- probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so actually establishing your neurological one rep max is probably a concept that you want to use. I agree. And then I think in terms of progressions, um, I've had a few patients come in where, uh, let's say they, they, I had like a patient with chronic ankle instability, um, where they would always squat and they would lead forward to the toes. But then as soon as we made those changes in ankle and like, like pressure through the foot, they, they felt quote unquote weaker. Right. So like we've completely changed the mechanics from bottom chain up. And so her, her perceived intensity or her, her RPE, whatever you want to call it, uh, had gone up significantly, but at a lighter load. But now that she's kind of continued through that and she's progressed that back, she's actually been hitting more PRs than what she had before that. Yeah. And 
in that specific example, I would speculate that she's probably quad dominant. Mm -hmm. Then you shifted her back at her foot and then she started using low back hamstrings and glutes along with her quads. So, you know, step back actually allows you to activate bigger, stronger muscle mass in conjunction with your strength and grow. Um, I guess like in an example like that, so somebody comes in, let's just kind of lay out this arbitrary example. Mm -hmm. They're seeing you for whatever the issue may be. Okay. But mm -hmm. let's say you still want to keep up volume and some intensity, but what's like a general rule of thumb that you, you try to give people to keep training volume going while managing intensity? I guess I could like give you an example. Yeah. Like I, I really like telling this person to hit tempo. Mm -hmm. So as long as like, it's not painful. Um, I think a lot of tempo training is done somewhere south of about 60% of one rep mm -hmm. max. So I usually ask people to start at like 50% and then maybe do something where it's like a set of three to five where you're having a three second eccentric, pause in the hole, establish a good position, then drive up. Mm -hmm. So that way you keep adequate loads at that actual intensity, but it's still perceived as being a hard workout yeah. because of the time under tension aspect. Yeah, I've done that before. Another thing I've done is I've also used a lot of like exercise variation. So like, let's say your your back squat, let's just use back squat is like, it's, it's uncomfortable. You get down to the bottom of the hole and then coming up and out of it, you, you have a little bit of pain. So like some different things that I've done to kind of either shorten the concentric or um, maintain loading is like, for example, the Louis Simmons box squat. Love it. I'll use that. I'll modify that. Um, that way we have less time going from that, that eccentric phase into that concentric portion, right? They can actually kind of sit back, set, and then they can go and kind of prepare themselves for that concentric aspect to it. Um, I can add band assist to that to make the concentric portion even um, less difficult and a, a lighter load or a load that they've been struggling with so that they can still get that aspect and kind of lower that into the hole too. Um, I kind of will modify and switch the exercise based off what the symptoms they, they report to me. Um, but I mean, I, I don't want them to like ever be like afraid of the movement. So I'll try to keep them in that movement, modify their movement pattern, and then load it appropriately or modify the phase that is more irritating. Sure. And I think that this is a pretty key concept for keeping the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at something like a box squat, or another one would be like a, a floor press. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you're doing this, you're, you're most likely trying to keep what, what I would say is probably tricep or quad strength while you're allowing the external rotators to catch up. So this doesn't mean that you're not utilizing them, but you're not taking them to the depth that it's symptomatic. Exactly. So then you keep that neural stimulus of a heavy load in a pain-free range of motion. And then most likely you're addressing it with some sort of single leg, tap down, step down, split squat, lunge. So that way you can load this range of motion and keep it so that you don't get stiffness. Exactly. And, and address your underlying issue, right? Kind of find why, why, so like, for example, going back to the back squat, let's say it's anterior knee pain, right? They get down to the bottom of the hole, pain on the way back up, right in the very front of the knee. You, there could be in uh, how many different variables that are going to affect that anterior knee pain, right? Um, but you can find what kind of provokes it, find out how to modify it, and if they can keep training. Cool. You just gave them access into sustaining their training as part of just one habit and schedule. Uh, you don't take them out of their, basically out of their habitat because they can sustain that, that community aspect. So not only are we in affecting their ability to keep training, but then also, you know, the psychosocial aspect of it too. Um, I know 
I mean, for example, you and I have both gone through phases where when we get hurt or, you know, we can't train. I mean, like you've told me and I've told you, like, just bugs the heck out of us. Like, we want to be able to train. It's, it's depressive. It is. Like, as far as all that stuff's concerned, too, like, finding a way to keep your, your athlete in the gym or a part of community, assuming they can do it smartly, really helps them from going other places. Um, mm-hmm. uh, apparently, Australia is recommending exercise now as a depression treatment. Yeah, And it's like one and a half times more successful than anything that they have. Even antidepressants. Yep. Like that's, that's insane to me, but it's also like, like, why wouldn't you want to exercise? <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's what we're built to do. I know. Um, Move. Who would have thought? So uh, I, w- I will give like a caveat to that anterior knee pain thing. Mm -hmm. So the box is probably great if you have like a, um, like an ankle limitation guys. So Mm -hmm. like, don't, don't think that a box squat is always the substitute. Okay. So if it's more of like a knee quad patella tendonitis type of issue, the box squat is kind of the antithesis of what you would likely want to do for that as well. So Mm -hmm. please choose your modifications correctly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> meaning that tendonitis responds really well to a bunch of time under tension and isometric holding. Whereas other versions of anterior knee pain or hip pain may respond very well to a limited range of motion for the time being. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is, this is kind of a good segue into maybe what Dave and I will plan to do with this is if you guys want examples um, you know, maybe we'll put up a question later on the Instagram and we can ask people, you know, shoulder pain, well, give us a type of shoulder pain or maybe what movement you struggle with. And maybe we can, you know, provide a few, I wouldn't say solutions, but, you know, some entry points for you to kind of maybe modify or adjust. Um, and then we can take it from there. Yeah. Um, even though like extrapolate on that, like if you want us to cover a particular type of rehab, say you have post-op shoulder, post-op knee, uh, et cetera, yeah, we can kind of just like walk you through a, a thoughtful and logical way to go through a post-operative phase of rehab to eventually yeah. allow you to accept the load again at your higher intensities. And Thank luckily you. it all does kind of like go back to these three pretty basic principles of strength and conditioning. Um, and we'll just get more detailed with it. Like the type of muscle contractions that you're trying to place emphasis on will dictate your intensity as well. Bingo. So doing something with like a three second eccentric is obviously not going to yield the same percentage as something like a, a bouncy, quick, powerful squat. So yeah, we can kind of talk through some of the, the gray or the nuance in that as well. Um, yeah, I, I think one thing that we probably should touch a little mm-hmm. bit of a base on with intensity mm-hmm. is probably the neurological side. Yes, let's let's circle back to that. Uh, so you want to try to maintain as much of this as possible. Obviously, in a post-operative setting, you lose it. And that's what we talked about was establishing a new intensity, Mm -hmm. but, but the more successful programs at breeding strength athletes tend to touch on some max effort at a minimum of once a week. Um, Mm -hmm. a lot of them follow upper and then a lot of them follow lower. And then if you're doing college, you get to change the variation every time. Um, Mm -hmm. if you're doing Bulgarian stuff, you might work to a, max within a training session three to four days a week but the reason that this is imperative is because you want to keep as high an expression of explosiveness as possible when you're talking about a sprint or a one rep max lift or a box jump you need something that's going to dial in your your nervous system 
I always like to think as um, like you're priming an engine kind of a thing. So like one thing I've had a lot of my athletes before um, either competition lips, um, if you're going to be using particular muscles for a long time or repeated efforts, like in baseball for throwing, um, I'll have them prepare by utilizing a similar or maybe lesser intense um, movement to kind of prep the muscles, prep the movement pattern, kind of stimulate the system, kind of get things going. And then after that, as they continue to build through that, you kind of see better jumps um, in terms of athlete preparation and also like just confidence levels. Um, and I think when they are dealing with an injury, sometimes that also provides like if it might be bothering them a little bit and they go through that dynamic warm up uh, and then pain kind of subsides, blood flow, you know, muscle contraction, deal, dialing things up, uh, that also provides that increased level of confidence as they try to work back into the sport too. Uh, in terms of loading and, uh, you know, motor recruitment, we could go into that. I, I, I'd like to save that for another episode in particular. Um, sure. So we'll, we'll talk on that a little bit more, but in terms of like neural preparation, uh, dynamic warmups, 10 out of 10 every time. Um, I've seen too many athletes at high school games this, this spring, uh, either baseball or track and they're sitting there doing a static hamstring stretch before a sprint. And I'm like, Oh Christ. Okay. I'll see you in like probably a week or two. Here's my card. <laughs> Just like stuff like that. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's a very interesting topic to touch on within itself. Like when is mobility good versus bad? Uh, mm -hmm. but 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 this maintenance of intensity can even look as something uh, as simple as maybe you have an exercise and directly after it you have them go into a two or three high jump broad jump type of deal for max yeah. effort right mm -hmm. so the idea is that you're trying to get as much of the muscle fiber to fire as possible to maintain explosive adaptations and that can be expressed whether it's through weight whether it's through speed whether it's through bounding um, or something like a plyometric push-up, assuming it's symptom-free, of course. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the idea is to sprinkle this stuff in at a low to possibly moderate volume mm -hmm. and pick it smartly, likely towards the beginning of your session when you need the CNS to be the most ready. Great. I think uh, actually we covered uh, post activation potentiation on uh, the lab with uh, Brandon and Alex. We talked about that. Um, so if you guys want to go over to the lab and check that out, I, I implore you to go do that. Um, we'll probably incorporate um, maybe different dynamic warm ups you could include, say for like maybe Olympic weightlifting, uh, you know, preparing for deadlift, squat, or a bench. Um, just let us know what you guys want to know. We'll. We'll talk through it. All right. Uh, anything else you wanted to add on intensity, Dave? Yeah, I think that, that topic's pretty well dead, and it'll kind of okay. go into other pieces of a step into the future. But as far as like a broad uh, umbrella, I think that's probably a pretty good place to start. And we can pick off some of the uh, other pieces that we still have to touch on. Sounds like a plan, man. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed our conversation here today. Uh, we will see you guys in the next episode. Yep. See you next week.